This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I pulled up a couple of reviews of Ben's book when it came out in March, and uh, well, it was reviewed in March, and I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you because I think that's a good way to introduce. Uh, Roberto Antiveros, who wrote in the Chronicle, has a few nice things to say. In the novel, which takes place in an unnamed California city in the early 1990s, a returning Gulf War vet, Waste no time falling back into the rough life of getting plastered, hustling honeys in a neighborhood being taken over by Asian gangs and muses that in the barrio, a brain would not get you where you wanted to go. A mind made you a fool. Perfect health meant you were worried about death, but crazy meant independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of pain. Feasting on government cheese in order to save their money for booze, Sierra's characters experience a dark epiphany. Why do they give us cheese? One asks, the answer, they know what mice like. Ben was born and raised in the Mission District. He joined the Marine Corps. You can read all this wonderful stuff on the back of his book at 17 and engaged with the uh, activities of the Gulf War in the front lines, the first one. Um, in 1998, he got his uh, bachelor's degree from Berkeley after he'd returned. He got a master's degree and teaching credential at San Francisco State, and because he just couldn't get enough of this educational purpose, and as he said, I didn't want to get a job, he got his law degree from Hastings, too. He's a teacher now, professor at the City College of San Francisco. Catherine Lee in The Guardsman, writing about the book, uh, Barrio, Bo Barrio, ha, ha, Barrio Bushido, said, Benjamin Bach Sierra serves as an engine driven by cylinders of intellect and action for Sierra's empowerment movement to transform street culture into positive educational energy. Barrio Bushido, Bushido combines book knowledge, delving into abstract and critical ideas with street knowledge, reflecting harsh realities and life lessons. Intellect combined with action leads to power and fulfillment, Sierra said of this book's motivational message. Barrio Bushido transforms the urban Latin homeboy experience into a new intellectual, educational, literary, and artistic empowerment movement, his blog says. Sierra believes the book is capable of inspiring a life of the mind. His characters have philosophical and intellect, intellect, intelligent conversations. Even though they may speak in street language, their discussions are complex and existential, he said. These are very smart characters. Sierra hopes the book's exploration of shame, pride, purpose, life, and good versus evil will foster a worldview in which it's not treacherous to think. And I was going to stop there, but I looked at his blog, and somebody asked him, why should people read this book? So I'm going to share this with you if you didn't see it. And this does get webcast, so we'll do a little educational experience here. He says, first of all, this book is an entertaining, twisted story, a roller coaster ride of action and reflection, great intensity, and even greater downfall. All emotions are explored and poked at with a fire iron. The book shocks and transforms. I have never read a book like this in my entire life, and I would agree. It is a book that is politically incorrect and speaks from the first-person perspective of locus. Locus as philosophers, capitalists, and the first and men of flesh and blood, and with all the lust and love and paradoxes that humans experience. While reading and learning about the homies in the most intense situations, we learn about ourselves in the most intense situations. We cannot help but journey with them on their ups and downs, regardless of what judgments we may make about them. Lobo, Toro, and Santo are that captivating, that different, dynamic, and fascinating. Please welcome Ben Baxiera. Good evening, and thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you, um, Story Hour, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, UC Berkeley, and especially thank you, the audience. 
uh, for coming here and taking part in what I believe is a new genre of literature, okay? Um, but before I get to, to this literature, I'm sure some of you would like to know about the human being behind it. Uh, my name is Benjamin Vox Sierra. Um, as uh, D Dave said, I was born and raised in the Mission District of San Francisco. Um, I am a jungle boy, lice-headed, walking around the streets, not even understanding how to eat with a fork. For some reason, I thought it would be better for me to be a gang member than to be a noble savage. So I chose that as my destiny. At 17 years old, though, I knew what that destiny, that destiny would lead me to. And so I thought, of, I, I thought of a way to leave without being a coward. I ran away to the Marine Corps because it was a macho thing to do. And I wouldn't have to go to prison and prove myself. So I used to, I remember, as a young man in the Marines, I used to hope that maybe we could go to war so I could have war stories like the homeboys have war stories. And that came true for me, to my regret to a certain extent as well. Once I uh, completed my four years of active duty, I entered into school. And I'll tell you, the only reason that I started going to school, because I, I had basically dropped out by about the seventh grade, was because they gave me a GI Bill, which at that time was about $338 a month. But I thought it was a lot of money. I was used to being poor. I kept going to school. What was uh, one of the rationale? I didn't want to get a job, as uh, Dave said, uh, but, but also because I loved the learning. I was able to transfer here to UC Berkeley, obtain my bachelor's degree, and I taught high school for a year at a school 10 years earlier where I had been kicked out of, a school called Woodrow Wilson. And then 10 years later, I'm over there teaching. After that, I still had this book burning in me so I obtained my, I got into a Master of Fine Arts program over at State, and uh, it took me four years to write this book. I started writing it here at UC Berkeley as an undergrad, and then I paused it while I was teaching high school, and I continued it uh, once I got into the MFA program. So from 1997 to 2001, I completed a decent first draft. 2001, I did become somewhat tired of theory, of literature. I didn't feel grounded. I didn't feel as if I knew the world. And so I thought an education that would give me a rounder type of education was law. And so I applied over to UC Hastings and went into law school. At the same time, I, was, I, I began teaching part-time over at City College. And I, I, I had my daughter, Margarita, who's sitting right over there. And I was juggling so many different things around that by the time I graduated from law school and they offered me a tenure track position over at City, I said, this sounds like a good life. I didn't have any intentions of publishing this novel. I thought I was gonna be a, a man who enjoyed barbecues on the weekends and didn't start too much trouble. Uh, but in 2008, my, my brother, my soul brother, he was my father, really, because our father had died when I was a young boy. And um, my brother passed away, and I felt I needed to do something in his honor. And so I sought publication for this book. Um, I, I did get a New York agent, um, but an old professor of mine here at Berkeley was very interested in the book, and he gave me a lot of freedom to keep a lot of the themes in the book and also even have uh, uh, some part in the, um, in, in, the, in the cover, the cover itself. You know, uh, th this is by uh, an artist, uh, Andrea Young, and uh, uh, she created this, but you know, she, we toured the mission together in my lowrider, and she got these ideas from that. And so um, I was very happy to go with El Leon Literary Arts now, why is it 
that I wrote this book. I wrote it to find out about myself, to discover the mysteries embedded in me, and also to give myself some type of guide, some type of direction. And I do believe I fulfill that by writing this. The process of writing it was therapy for me for so many different things. Um, but but what, what is this now? After, after all the revision and the editing, I've come to discover that what I've done is I have synthesized many different types of literature and inventions, imaginations, to create what I, be what I believe is a new genre, and that is not, not, urban lit not urban fiction, but homeboy, homegirl, urban literature. Many times, urban fiction is portrayed as senseless, ultra-violent. With this book, I both confirm and smash those stereotypes. Now, before I begin reading of the book and talking about it, I'd, I'd like to invite the audience, for any questions that you have, any questions that you have of me, of my process of writing this. All right, all right, okay, okay. Well, Zen, go ahead, yes. In writing this book, it sounds like it's a very much a, a spiritual pursuit, and I was wondering, <laughs> what was the largest question that you sought to, to answer, and did you answer it? Uh, okay, as far as spirit, there is a lot of spirituality in this book. Deal with the metaphysical, uh, theology as well. <clears throat> and uh, what is the purpose of spirit? What is the purpose of God? Tonight, I will be reading an excerpt from a chapter entitled Prayer. And I, I think perhaps we can come to a conclusion together uh, uh, about, you know, whether I, whether I reached any type of conclusion regarding spirit, you know, after, after I, I read, read from, from that chapter. Okay. Um, any, other, any other questions? Yes, sir. I was a literature major, I was an English literature major, uh, but I really wanted to write. So I took all of the creative writing courses. I studied under uh, Maxine Hong Kingston and Tom Farber. And so I took all the courses I could in writing, in creative writing. I actually, one semester, you know, with my independent study courses, I was able to just full-time writing, you know. Uh, but I do believe literature was a, a gigantic component to my writing as well because I fed off of those authors. Their style and their rhythms are embedded in this book. You know, it's, so in that way, it goes beyond just a simple street story. Okay, so, all right. Yes, Jose. I was wondering, the notion of writing a new genre, is that something that you set out to do, that you discovered during the process, or was it after the fact that you said, that you came to that conclusion, wasn't it? After, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I do. And, and so notes. Uh, one of the writers that influenced me while I was spending time in juvenile hall as a little kid uh, was uh, D Donald Goins. He's an African-American author of the 1970s, but not viewed as literature. Not viewed as, now, interestingly enough, the French have started viewing his work uh, as literary, ha having some literary merit. Um, but he dealt with very gritty urban themes. And so I think I got a lot of ideas from uh, Goins, but also my own experiences and imagination. It wasn't really until after. And I read the book myself as an objective reader, uh, as a reader, not as a writer, but as a reader, that I started to realize, you know what? I've never read a book like this. What, what kind of book is this? And I, I, th that's when I started to, to understand that I do believe this is a new genre of literature. And, and wh why do I say this is a new genre of literature? Many Latinos have written, of course, many homeboys and homegirls have written books. But what I see many times is memoir or autobiography in those books. 
This book is not attempting to be memoir. If anything, it is mythology. It is mythology. And so note here that the literary value of this book is that I have created a mythology for street homeboys and homegirls. Now, and why is this so important, I believe? Literature is so important because I believe in, you know, at, at its essence, what it does is it spurs imagination. And if you do not have a literature, I think people are grounded in this reality. And this reality is only a partial reality. Mythology gives us so much. And that's what this book, I, I hope, is doing. Okay. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about the title of the book before I segue into uh, the readings uh, themselves. All right. The title is Barrio Bushido. Now, Barrio. What is barrio? What is a barrio or a barrio for those of you who are, are from the neighborhood? You know, you, we say with the V. What is it? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a neighborhood, right? You know, it's, it's the barrio for the gente, right? Okay, and so it, it's the neighborhood or the streets, right? Bushido. What is Bushido? Anyone? Bushido is the code of the samurai. The Code of Honor of the Samurai. And so know what I have done here. I have combined, this book is written in English, okay? Uh, but what I've done is I've combined Spanish and Japanese to write, a, to, to portray a story about American-born Latinos. This is the Code of the Streets. And note here, this code is not a written code. There, there really is no, you know, um, history of uh, Bushido in the barrio, a, a, a formal history of that. For example, in, in uh, the samurai, they, they, you know, they, they have centuries of history, you know, writings about what it means for something to be Bushido, right? Nevertheless, I argue in this book that there is a code. Part of that code is craziness, craziness. A big part of Barrio Bushido is the logic and the power of crazy. And I'm going to uh, dis discuss that a bit in uh, one of my other readings tonight. Okay? Now I'd like to talk about what I am going to read. I'm going to start with uh, a section called prayer. Uh, this is in the latter part of the novel, pages 177 to 178. <clears throat> And in this scene, we have a character. Her name is Sheila. She is the girlfriend of one of the protagonists. His name is Lobo, or the wolf. She's been kidnapped. She expects him to come save her because they do love each other. But Lobo, the wolf, is a greedy lustful man, and he has decided to embrace capitalism before love. Sheila knows she is going to die. She knows her love has abandoned her. Her last moments, what does she do? She prays. I'll read now. Pages 177 to 178. <clears throat> because there was nothing else left, Sheila prayed. Even though God had never answered her before, she knew praying could not hurt her. Afterwards, she started praying to Lobo because he was a living, concrete being. She thought that maybe he could actually hear her if she prayed hard enough. But he was no God, and even love had its limits. She realized the only person she had ever known 
and would ever know in her life was she herself. And then it sledged, hammered her with a shocking simplicity. She should and would pray to herself with a faith in her own power and strength. Sheila, as her own God, squeezed her eyes shut. She did not want blackness, but the redness and stars that come when one concentrates on the internal darkness. For some reason, she thought that in the purple and blue darkness, she could find a link to another world, somewhere buried inside of her. She clenched her fists, pleading to herself, I pray to me. Frightened, she stopped. But as time was not stopping, she knew she had to continue. Sheila, I pray to me, whoever you are, here, here is my prayer. I'm not locked up, but I'm free. I own the air. She calmed and remained in nothingness for a couple of minutes. Sheila, with your might, command that man. You know the times you spent together, the joy you shared. You know the times and your power. You are the one. Tell him what you want him to do. Inside of herself, she had control. By going inside, she had entered Lobo's spirit. With this great power, she found elation and a peace. Perhaps she should command him to save her. Her selfishness haunted her. Then she decided, be free. Whatever you do, Mr. Lobo, do it because you love me. Because you love me. You love me. Lobo, you love me. Okay, I want to give a brief literary analysis of that piece here. Here we find a street homegirl who has evolved beyond being on the streets. She has entered into the metaphysical and found God within her own self. This requires complexity, requires courage as well, OK? And in her last moments, she found a freedom in loving herself, even though she knows she's damned. We have a stereotype about prayer, that it is meant to comfort us and to wish for things, for fantasies. In this piece, we see that prayer is not used to wish for fantasy. Prayer is used to help someone else. And in her last moments, before she is killed, you, you, you would find out later in the novel, she realizes that prayer helps her accept death. It doesn't save her from it. The best she can hope for is love for someone that she loved. She knows she's gone. 
She doesn't pray to be saved. Okay, the next piece that I will, actually, before, before I uh, continue with another piece, um, questions, questions or, or, or comments on, on that, that piece called prayer. Yes, Beverly. Sorry. Um, so, since she finds, you know, she's praying within herself, is it in that way it supersedes religion? But it's uh, uh, I, I think it does. Zen, you were asking about spirit earlier. And so for her, this is a woman. Uh, now, it's not discounting the possibility of God. But notice what her epiphany is that God is too gigantic of an abstraction to truly believe in. She does not understand that concept. Now, does that make her stupid or weak? No. She, she tries to connect the concept of God to something else. At first, it's Lobo. But she knows that she doesn't even know who that is. If she's praying to Lobo, why is she praying to Lobo? Lobo is just a man. Who is she? Who is she? And she realizes that that's the only person she will ever know in her whole life. Right? She, she, she will know no one else. And so she decides that she herself has the power of heaven and hell. Of forever. It's embedded in her. She prays to herself. She prays to herself. Okay, I am now going to transfer into uh, a section about a character named Toro. And Toro means the bull. Uh, this character in this particular scene is 12 years old, and he has decided to join a gang. Now, this young boy, he's not very popular. He's a savage little boy. He's not very cool. He doesn't understand street grace. But he wants gang membership badly. He thinks that the best way to join the gang, since they're not openly recruiting him, is to do something fantastic. And what he decides to do is challenge the leader of the gang to a fist fight after school. Even though Toro himself does not know how to fight. And so in this scene, he has challenged the leader. And the leader's name is Santo, Saint. And this is another protagonist of, of this story. Craziness as a virtue. Craziness as a virtue, OK? Uh, this is on pages 223 to 224. And in this, this part here, Santo has accepted the challenge of the fight. Bajo Park. Santo smiled and walked away at the lead of the homeboys. He did not think twice about it because he did not consider Toro a very serious threat. Toro, however, knew exactly what this meant. Throughout the day, he remained silent, lonely as always, yet strangely Happy. When the school bell rang, he walked through the back streets where no one would see him. He knew that this would be the last time doing it this way. He knew that this day marked a beginning. As with all new experiences, there was sadness, anticipation, and fear. He did not know whether he was making the best choice. The homeboys might jump him. The fight might mean embarrassment beyond belief, especially if he were to lose severely. The homeboys did not care about getting into trouble. 
Totoro knew only that the loneliness he endured and the shame he carried around in his heart were too much to bear. He would either break out of despair or die trying. No one else would fight his battle or force him to cross the street in fear. No one would snatch honor's imagination away from him. For he saw himself as not so cool and not so quick with slick words and fine rhymes. But he saw himself accepted and he imagined the noblest of words from other vatos locos mouths. Toro, he's crazy, a down homeboy. And crazy was the best compliment he could ever hope for. For crazy meant he was sick with it and out of his mind, insane, no brain, one of the few and true. He knew that in the barrio, a brain would not get you where you wanted to go. A mind made you a fool. Perfect health meant you were worried about death, but crazy meant independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of pain. Because Toro knew crazy had consequences. That's what made crazy so complete and fulfilling because it could never be mistaken for a fairy tale. All of the homeboys could believe in it. And a crazy homeboy only feared one thing, living too long. And a crazy homeboy would go up and meet the challenge without the security of confidence. A crazy homeboy was always unsure about every little movement and sound. But a crazy homeboy knew that his insanity would never abandon him. As Toro closed in on the park and saw homeboys passing around a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 wine, Toro knew that showing up for the fight was sheer lunacy. Yet he continued, sure and steady. He looked around at the scattered oak trees of Bajo Park, the empty basketball courts. Santo was nowhere. For one second, he knew it was not too late to turn back. Santo must have not taken the challenge seriously. Toro could return back to whence he came from without any loss of face. But Toro instead walked up to one of the homeboys and asked, where's Santo? He's kicking it at the house, the homeboy said. Go tell him that it's time to fight, Toro said. The homeboy's head retreated, confused at the audacity of such a person. Who should I tell him's here? The young homie asked. He'll know. Toro folded his arms and postured himself against the wire gate. The homeboy took off and 
Toro had never learned how to fight nor box. In his head, all Toro could do was go over Bruce Lee and Rocky movies because he had no game plan whatsoever. Okay, a brief literary analysis here, okay? <laughs> Craziness as a virtue, but beyond a virtue. Craziness as life and reality itself. <clears throat> now, in order to survive with some type of dignity in this counterculture, twisted society, one must accept the logic of craziness. Vario craziness is also America. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of pain, not happiness. Because understand that happiness can never be a goal. It's too cliche. It's too unoriginal. It doesn't have enough profoundness to it in the barrio. Craziness is seen as more authentic than happiness, even though these characters understand that craziness leads to prison, drug addiction, death. Intelligently, they still choose it. Now, <clears throat> why is this? Craziness comforts. Craziness is a friend. It's what we find out in, in, this, in this piece. Okay, all right. Um, question. Question so far. Questions or comments about, about anything that I, I've stated here or things that you can imagine? Yeah, yes, in, in the back. Go ahead, Xinye. Uh, how do we <coughs> work with a, a sedated and, and complacent society and bring them to a crazy? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Interesting question, all right. Um, now, now I, I'm, I'm going to dig in uh, perhaps beyond your question here. And I, I believe you're, at, you're implying that we, we have a society that, that, from your perspective anyway, is, is somewhat indifferent, indifferent, okay? And, and so, so note here, um, these people, for better or worse, I, I would argue they are not indifferent about life. They live. They feel life. Right? They may not be the most educated. They may not be uh, a, a people in society who are admired, yet they feel that life. Now, I am not promoting vario type of craziness. All right, I would not be up here right now if, uh, if that, that is what I base my complete life upon. However, I do feel that myself personally, craziness has helped me in my education, and in my life. It has allowed me to be bold, to be tactfully confrontational. When I remember coming here to UC Berkeley. I, I was just uh, uh, sharing with some people earlier today. The first time I entered into this campus, I wanted to turn back around because I didn't feel as if I belonged here. Craziness kept me coming. And when it was the first day of class, it was time for me to raise my hand and volunteer to be the first one for assignments. Craziness and that spirit helped me. So note here the energy of it, right? It, it, it's not, for example, I, I did a, um, a conference uh, about three weeks ago, and I talked about the distinction between leadership by example and leadership by energy. Okay, and I think this does apply uh, uh, to your question here, right? Look, <clears throat> I think there are many more people who are better examples than I am. They may stand straighter. They um, have read more books than I have. They have written more pages. 
right? Okay, so they may be better examples than I am, all right? But it's not examples that people follow. People follow energy. I believe that this book carries an energy in it, an energy, okay? And if we can extract that energy, and if we can find profoundness in these characters, in this uh, population that is usually dismissed and vilified, I believe we can be more total human beings. If we could go beyond the cliches of who these people really are. And we see, you know, there is a logic to craziness. There is a reason why they choose this. Okay, all right. Any, any other uh, questions or, or comments so far? Okay. Oh, yes, sir, please. Yeah, I have just a brief question about um, the first thing you read on prayer. Okay. Um, when Sheila actually starts to pray, you said that it was, she had nothing left. Is it, do you think that there's that, that, that sort of experience of having nothing left or having nothing in terms of what sort of allows you to turn into the self? Or is it uh, unrelated to that? You, you know, my own experiences with the concept of intense prayer, um, I think I think so, you know, and, and I, I remember praying during the war, you know, and, and getting bombed. And, you know, there's nothing we can do. I was a machine gunner. So, you know, you, you cannot fight artillery with a machine gun. And um, I remember I was making some pretty uh, dramatic promises, you know, to I, I don't even know who or what it was, but it made me turn into myself. And then afterwards, I can remember it, it created in me a great feeling of shame too. And I had to evaluate myself about that because I became ashamed because I thought to myself, wow, how weak of me to actually pray and to beg, you know? And then so I had to deal with that as well, you know? So uh, yeah, it, it, I think it does require uh, some intense moments. And, and, you know, just to relate it back to the book here, that's what these people have. They have very intense moments. Right? And they flesh out these moments. Right? And they, they, have, they have time and ability to deal with these complex ideas. You know? Okay. Yes? Um, you, said that, you said that this was different from the other urban fiction because you said it as more of a mythology. Okay. And you suggested that there was a kind of distance between you and the book in terms of just it's not factual. And you seem to have this really strong connection at the same time with everything that happens. So I'm wondering, like, how you keep that simultaneous connection and distance, and you know what I mean? That makes it this kind of literature. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. Yeah, and I and I do have. I mean, I, I wrote the book, but but no. It's me, but it's not me. Notice, the character Sheila is, is a female character. You know, in that particular situ situation, I've never been, so it requires an imagination. And it, 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 it requires me to go, worse than going outside of myself, going inside of myself, right? And, and so this simultaneous interaction is occurring, right? You know, I do have experiences with prayer. I do have experiences with the concept of crazy, but I have to imagine I have to imagine, I have to research as well. I have to remember stories from the homies about craziness, you know, and think back to those things, right? And, uh, you know, I, I did not get into uh, uh, some of the magically real sections of the book, although some might say that the prayer section uh, uh, borders on that. But we have a character in this book named Santo. And in English, that means saint. This man believes that he is a saint, but not for Christian ideals. He believes that he is a saint for the cholos. This man believes that he is the ultra homeboy. And every action in his life it revolves around that identity. And that causes him a great amount of stress and paranoia and also gives him, in the book anyway, some supernatural powers. At the end of the book, he is, he is performing miracles. And he has also taken part in his own form of Bushido. And this form of Bushido that he has created, 
right? One, uh, one of the tenets of Bushido, and you know, I, I think we make uh, perhaps a little too much of this, but is seppuku. Seppuku is uh, known as harikari, right? And, and for samurais, they are supposed to uh, disembowel themselves, right? Okay, and uh, Santo figures out a barrio Bushido. He knows that, like Sheila, because he has done some pretty evil things, he knows that his homeboys are supposed to kill him. But he doesn't want his best friends to live with the guilt of killing him. Yet he also wants to inspire them to something else. Right? And so we have a character like that in here. Right? And that, that character has been me, but it hasn't been me. A and how did I come up with that? You know, uh, I, I would argue that a big part of how I came up with that is through reading literature and reading mythology, having studied the Bible, for example. And you know, th that is why I'm saying this is a new genre of literature. Because what we have here is we have mythology. We have myth mythology mixed with reality. And those two are powerful, uh, it's a powerful combination because people can feel that it's real, but also feel that it is ex it's stretching their concept of the real, stretching their imaginations. All right, now I, I want to say a couple of things uh, about, about this literature. Um, one is that this is a book that I believe has found its time. One, I got it published, so all right. It, it's great that it, it's published, it's out there, you know, and uh, some instructors have been teaching it now for the past couple of semesters since it's been uh, released. I would argue that we need to have this book taught much more. I've had high school instructors who have been teaching it now. Uh, uh, recently, I've been invited to go to the University of uh, North Dakota and take part in the Red River uh, Valley uh, Writing Project to, to um, explain to them how urban fiction can be used in a K through 12 setting. All right, so now that, that's great that they're interested in this and you, know, you all are interested in this as well because you know, you're here. Um, but I find that there is a disconnect to finding that this can be literature. Now, I, I'm gonna tell you something about the pieces that I read right now. The pieces that I read right now are very intense pieces, but they are from the third person perspective, okay, from an omniscient narrator perspective. Many portions of this book are in a first person perspective. So you have homeboys and homegirls slanging and speaking in their street vernacular. And they are being, you know, misogynistic. They are being violent and unashamed about being that way. I think that makes some people hesitate to regard this as literature because they see it. The first couple of pages, the, the guys are glorifying, you know, an angel dust party that they've been involved in. Right now, I, I mean, it's, it's a realistic situation, but there is a lot of, you know, very uh, taboo subjects involved in that, in that, in those first two scenes. You know, I think it should shock people when they read it. I think people should perhaps even want to put it down after the first chapter. But I believe that they should, they should find it within themselves to see the art and the depth and continue reading to find more. Now, how are they gonna find it if it's not out there? I think who has more of a connection to this book, and this is no offense to the professors who are here in this uh, room, I, I believe it's gonna have to be students who demand this type of literature in the classrooms. Students are the ones who are more involved in a literature that involves this kind of slang. Why is this? You are the ones who have been impacted more than I have been, uh, more than I think e even uh, some, some of my older colleagues. You, you, you've been impacted by international war, globalism, technology that we've never seen before. This 
type of literature is modern literature. And I believe it is going to be students' tasks to tell professors and, you know, those professors who are here now and hopefully uh, um, thinking about this to, to say, you know what, I'm going to take the chance even though it may offend. I'm going to take the chance of uh, teaching this even though I know that there are some taboo subject matters here. Let's, let's talk about them. Let's not hide them anymore. Okay. All right. Um, a couple of other things. I know, I know it's, it's seven now, but I, I want to ask uh, those of you who are here. Uh, you seem friendly. You know me now. I am your friend. All right. I'm doing a lot of different things. I'm not just writing. I'm using this as a springboard to start nonprofit organizations, you know, to lecture, you know, uh, and, and, you know, just communicate, you know, about a lot of different issues. OK, add me as a friend on Facebook if you haven't already. OK. All right. So, you know, that that's what it's supposed to be about. Right. OK. Uh, also, another thing you can do is you can subscribe to my blog. If you go onto my uh, on Facebook, you'll see that there is a link to my blog. I'm currently updating that. And, and you know, uh, if you want to find out more about my ideas and evolve these ideas, uh, I invite you to, to do that. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask of me, um, I, on Facebook, there is a link to my email address. Please email me, and I'd love to get back to you, OK? Um, it's been my pleasure to serve you. Thank you so much. Thank you.